Good morning, and thank you for that kind introduction, Professor Lacou. And welcome to Kids Operating Rooms Centre for Global Operations in Dundee, Scotland. My name is David Cunningham, and it is a great pleasure to be speaking with you today. I'm here in our mock operating room, which, among other things, is used by our engineers to do video calls with their counterparts in hospitals across the world. We can help remotely diagnose problems and even talk through repairs, all without the need for travel or sending unnecessary supplies. Upstairs, our shipping team coordinate the movement of equipment around the world, firstly, usually in bulk into here and then onwards to their end destination, navigating daily challenges like overcrowded ports to more interesting problems like the Suez Canal blockage or even erupting volcanoes, as our engineer working near Goma in the DRC found out recently. But before we start, let's go out to our warehouse floor to see what's happening today. So from out here, at any one time, more than 30 operating rooms worth of equipment are being processed and prepared for distribution to a partner surgeon. Like this load behind me now, which is being prepared to make its journey to Nigeria. And from here, we send brand new world-class equipment to create state-of-the-art operating rooms in partner countries across the world, with a particular focus on Africa and Latin America. And this year, despite the challenges of our time, the team here in Dundee will receive, test, assemble, pack, clear for customs, and ship a brand new operating room to a partner hospital on average once every 12 days. Our research shows that each one of these new operating rooms, when given to a highly skilled local surgical team, will go on to provide at least 600 children a year with access to life-changing or often life-saving care. And as a result, by the end of 2021, our operating rooms will have created enough capacity for more than 30,000 children to access care every single year. In so doing, we are helping our partner surgical teams avert more than half a million years of disability for every single year of activity across all kids' operating rooms around the world. The projected economic benefit of that, when you consider children who will now grow up to contribute to their nation's economy rather than dying in childhood or living their whole lives in disability, is a staggering one billion US dollars a year every year our operating rooms are working. But our team here in Dundee do more than just ship that vital operating equipment. From here, we also coordinate and manage construction projects, like we are currently doing in Zambia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and in Nigeria. We conduct remote surveys, like we are currently doing in Tanzania, Ghana, and the Gambia. And we coordinate our installation and engineering teams based in both West and East Africa. So as you can hopefully tell, this is a busy hub of activity, transforming surgical care for children around the world. And whether in our head office in Edinburgh, here in Dundee, or in our Africa office in Kenya, the entire kids operating room team are working flat out to help bring a shared vision of a world where every child can access safe surgery closer to being a reality. But how did we get here? How do we sustain growth? And what comes next? These are all the things I hope to cover today in this Hugh Greenwood Lecture for 2021. Let's go back into the quieter operating room and get started with the lecture. That's better. I'd like to start today by thanking the British Association for Paediatric Surgery for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm all too aware of those who have delivered this lecture before me and the very large boots I must try to fill today. In preparing, I have had the pleasure to learn more about the extraordinary Hugh Greenwood. His work ethic, his compassion, and his simply stated aim to help as many children as possible during my life is something that very much resonates with me, our founders Gareth and Nicola, and the whole team here at Kids OR. So where did this all start? Well, it started with a phone call, or to be more specific, two phone calls. I cannot stress enough, nor ever thank enough, the inimitable Professor George Youngson for being both a mentor to me over many years helping guide the development of children's services both here in Scotland and latterly overseas, and of course, for making the first of those two phone calls, 
the one that started the ball rolling towards where we are now. I recall clearly being in Fraserburgh, in the far northeast of Scotland, about to give a talk at the local high school when I took the call. Professor Youngson was in Kampala. He had just met Dr. John Sekabira and he wanted to respond to Dr. Sekabira's call for help. What followed was a process that quickly identified the need to provide Dr. Sekabira with his own operating room. Sending more surgeons was pointless. He needed his own space to care for Uganda's children and to train the next generation of surgeons too. And so the second phone call, this time from me to Gareth Wood, asking if he'd help fund the project. Such were the funding restrictions that without his and his wife Nicola's support, we knew we couldn't proceed. About a year later, having also gone on to work with some 90 plus schools in an education fundraising programme, and having received a very welcome grant from Johnson & Johnson. But with Gareth and Nicola taking the unenviable position of being the project's underwriters, having so believed in the project that they had essentially written a blank cheque to make it happen, we opened our first, and of course an absolute one-off, operating room in Kampala, Uganda. I remember the first patient, a seven-day-old baby, I've never seen a baby look so small or frail, a tiny bag of skin and bones, clinging on to life with each and every breath, all of us expecting each breath to be his last. The baby had a small bowel atresia and it was a miracle he had survived so long. His dad had brought him to the hospital. The terrified look of despair on his face told its own story of what had come before this child had even been born. The hope and expectations, the plans, the dreams of what this child their first would grow up to become. It was impossible not to sympathise and share in the despair of the seemingly hopeless situation. So needless to say, once in the care of the skilled local team though, in their own fully equipped operating room, the operation took place without delay. The surgeons no longer battling with adult equipment, adult lists, adult emergencies for theatre time. And against all the odds, the child's life was saved, feeding for the first time, albeit through a temporary feeding tube, shortly after the operation. It seems clear that he would not have survived even a few more hours without the care he received that day. And so this one-off project, as they tend to do, soon became two and then three and more. However, it was Gareth who first recognised the need for this work to be done full-time in a new organisation dedicated to creating capacity for safe surgery. And if I'm honest, George and I pushed back at first suggesting that it could be done in tandem with all of our other commitments and our other various roles. But to his great credit, Gareth is not a man who takes no for an answer, and he persevered, inviting me to a breakfast meeting to discuss progress. In my experience, breakfast meetings are rarely dull affairs. No one really wants to work at breakfast time, so you only genuinely do so if it's important and you tend to get to the point quickly. Gareth did not disappoint. He told me now was the time to form a new organisation, that he would sell his business empire to fund it, and that I had to quit my job to come and run it with him and Nicola. I'm still not entirely sure I had a great deal of choice. I definitely don't remember what I had for breakfast, but needless to say, I agreed without a second's hesitation. We then immediately started work convincing George Youngson to join us, and Dave Tipping too. Dave being the person who had thrived in the challenge of project managing that first operating room in Uganda, and a good few more since then too. Indeed, he now leads this whole team in here in Dundee, and our project installations around the world. And so, in January 2018, Kids Operating Room officially launched, a name purposefully chosen to keep us focused on the single task of providing safe surgery for children. There would be no mission creep here. The task in hand is already too great as it is. And before I move on, I should point out there are many, many others who have played key roles in our development. And I would like to pause and try to thank them all. But of course, to name them all would take up the rest of my talk. And so it is customary not to even try. However, in addition to those already mentioned, there are some pivotal roles played by Dennis Robson, Darukos Geddes and his team, especially Maya and Eva, who first published, published on our impact. Kakila Laku and John, Nasser, Phyllis and Mary in Uganda, who were willing to believe in us that we could deliver for them, who all deserve special mention. And so, with Kids Operating Room established, we commenced a process of listening. 
Mission-based care just felt wrong to us. We had seen firsthand the difference that can be made when you invest in the local surgeon. So this process was important to us. Did we really understand what we were trying to do? By May 2019, we had opened a string of new operating rooms, but we also had a strategy for Africa written and launched at the World Health Assembly in Geneva, supported ably by both COSEXA and WACS, who had committed no less than the president, Professor Pankaj Jani, and the immediate past president, Professor King David Yahweh, respectively, to the project. Both giants in their fields who committed time and energy to devise our strategy for Africa, something we are especially grateful for. And although I say our strategy, in truth, this was the distilled thoughts and aspirations of surgical teams from across the continent. So it was really the strategy of the surgeons working in Africa themselves, and I think at least it was very ambitious. By 2030, we have committed to open 120 new operating rooms in Africa, each one equipped with brand new world-class equipment. Where they don't exist, we'll fund a training scholarship for the surgeon and or the anaesthetist. We anticipate funding 100 surgical scholarships during this decade. When we are done, we'll have increased capacity for safe surgery in Africa by more than 72,000 children a year. And when we look again at the impact in disability life years averted, we'd expect that to be in excess of 1.2 million years averted for every single year of full activity in our operating rooms. Removing that huge burden of disability from nations across Sub-Saharan Africa is projected to strengthen those economies by a combined total of 2.5 billion US dollars a year, every year while these operating rooms are functioning. Understanding the data of how surgery impacts on society is also key to what we do, and we are especially proud of our partnership with UCSF, who independently access and audit data from our operating rooms. As this database grows into a world-leading resource for children's surgery in low-resource settings, we're starting to see some fascinating early results. First of all, 55% of operations are emergent cases, with more than 60% of all operations taking place on children under six years old. We know there is an overall mortality rate of 2.2%. The only comparable studies showing paediatric mortality in non-kids OR settings was 3.7%. And using our data set so far, we have created a paediatric surgical mortality risk calculator, which is significant for our partner surgeons as the only previously available risk prediction models are all based on data from high income countries. This will therefore be a world first and much more useful resource for our local teams. Our top five procedures across all sites are laparotomy, inguinal hernia repair, circumcision, appendectom appendectomy, and umbilical hernia. Burns and trauma also feature highly with some centers seeing more than 50% of their work being focused on burns and trauma leading to the potential for kids OR surgical data to be the driving force behind future public health measures in focused communities. Perhaps most surprisingly, there is emerging evidence to show the surgical site infection levels in a kids operating room facility is as low as 4.7% from a review of almost 5,000 patients. This compares favorably to studies in the Netherlands at 6.6%, NHS England at 4.8%, and significantly better than previous studies in Africa, which placed this figure at 23.6%. Understanding this data, using it to further improve how we invest and using it to seek even better patient outcomes is vitally important. However, using it to burst some myths around surgery in Africa and highlight the astonishing quality of care available in an increasing number of centers across the continent is equally important to us as we champion the exceptional workforce we are proud to partner with. However, away from the data and back to our plans, we realise that to make this strategy, which has the potential to be transformative, not just for the children, but for the families, the doctors selected to undergo specialist training, and the entire economy of nations, we knew we needed to pass leadership for this project over to an expert in African healthcare who was based much closer to these hospitals than we were in the UK. And so, around 18 months ago, we were delighted to welcome Rosemary Mugwe, a former CEO of Cosexa, to join our team leading on the delivery of this strategy and all of our work in Africa. Taking that decision to decentralize control 
and do all we could to fully understand the landscape in which we are working, has proven to be hugely successful. And under Rosemary's leadership, the strategy turned into a country-by-country -country plan, and the 120 hospitals inevitably became as many as 135. However, this work places us in a unique position of having a continent-wide, country-by-country understanding of exactly where the highest return on investment can be made through the development of safe surgery, which countries, regions, hospitals are best placed to scale up for those most in need. So when a donor wants to make the most of their funding, we can help them target this to achieve maximum impact in a way that has been designed by the local surgeons, hospitals and ministries of health. And through Rosemary's leadership, we have also secured political buy-in to this work. Just as the world was shutting down to tackle the growing threat of COVID-19, Gareth and Rosemary were in Lusaka, securing the first ever commitment from the East African Health Communities Health Ministers Meeting to prioritise children's surgery across their constituent countries of Eswatini, Kenya, Lesotho, Malawi, Mauritius, Tanzania, Uganda, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Indeed, in all of these countries, we now have active plans for infrastructure and scholarship development. In Lesotho, we'll be training the nation's first ever paediatric surgeons, just as we are also doing in Burundi, South Sudan and Liberia. Training more surgical teams who understand the local population and the structural barriers they face when trying to access care is something we strive to do everywhere we work. Now, what of that target for new infrastructure investment? Well, progress towards our overall goal of at least 120 new operating rooms in Africa by 2030 is going well. We have 70 of these either open or in development, many funded directly by Kids Operating Room through Gareth and Nicholas support, but many of them in partnership with others now too, such as our friends at SmileTrain. We are therefore ahead of the curve on infrastructure and anticipate this element of the strategy could move towards completion two or even three years ahead of schedule. In our training programmes, strong progress has been made in surgical scholarships. Again, with significant support from SmileTrain, a heavy investment of our own and with others too, we have been able to plan for the delivery of the first 63 scholarships. Progressing this element of our strategy any quicker is now limited principally by the capacity to train more surgeons rather than anything else. And at this stage, we are confident the additional 100 surgeons will be fully trained and deployed within the workforce in Africa by 2029, one year ahead of schedule. There are challenges though, not least in anaesthesia provision, Understanding exactly what each hospital's aspirations for care are, consultant-led with clinical officers or physician-level only, for example, is a process we are now completing. Training this workforce will not be without challenges either. The capacity for training new physician anaesthetists is severely limited in Africa. And we look forward to working with Canexa and the West African College of Surgeons as we all seek to improve this situation. Recognising the limited capacity for training, both in surgery and anaesthesia, and the unlevel playing field that is a natural occurrence in a mentor-based training programme, during 2018 and 19, we also listened a great deal to those who were already in training. How could we help them succeed? Why did some drop out? What was necessary to ensure quality, not just quantity, as the key outcome? To that end, we invested heavily in the creation of the first ever pan-African e-learning platform for children's surgery, written by more than 90 different African surgeons, with content mapped against both the COSEXA and the WAX curriculums. This gigantic project was delivered for us by the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland and launched in May of this year. Already supporting trainee surgeons, the platform looks well-placed to achieve its goals of reduce, reducing dropout and enhancing quality and patient safety. So I'm definitely proud of the successes our team have achieved so far. There's work to be done, of course, but the progress is clear and I think it's encouraging. Sustaining this work during a pandemic hasn't been without its challenges, but our remote assistance engineers, our Kenyan-based team, and our capacity to move equipment, if not always people, around has allowed us to sustain and even grow our work schedule. Yes, people have had to enter isolation in a number of different places, 
But these are the challenges we have gotten used to and a way of working we expect to continue to face for at least another year from now. COVID did delay one project, the world's first ever operating room for children to be opened in a refugee camp. Having successfully navigated a complex process of remote survey, equipment transportation, and the implementation of a training program for the local team led brilliantly by Dr. Nema Kasaji, an exceptional outbreak of COVID-19 in the camp saw that, that saw positivity rates top 30% understandably delayed our installation. However, I am pleased to report this outbreak has since died down, the unit has opened, and the refugee children, arguably the most forgotten and most vulnerable, now have access to an incredible level of care. We turn then to the future. Where do we go from here? Of course, there is much to do. We increasingly turn our thoughts and attention to Latin America, where inequality and the marginalization of the indigenous populations cause untold harm poor health and inequitable access to safe surgical care. Perhaps especially so in places like Bolivia, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Nicaragua, and in more remote areas of Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. We have opened new operating rooms in Haiti, Ecuador, and Peru. However, we plan to do much more in this region as the world opens up again. Our thoughts also turn to Southeast Asia, where often a lack of biomedical engineers leads to suboptimal theatre time and decreased productivity. How we start to tackle this in, for example, politically challenging nations like Myanmar, along with growth elsewhere, is an active topic of discussion for our team. However, these logistical, political and demographic challenges, I am confident we can overcome. The real challenge, and therefore the greatest prize to be achieved, is arguably in an entirely different activity not simply through the building of more operating rooms, not even through training more and more surgeons, but through a focus and a sustained program of advocacy, campaigning even, for change in how global health aid is spent. This is likely to be the action that stands the greatest chance of rapidly increasing global access to safe surgical care. This argument, though, is not new. In the 1978 Alma-Ata Declaration, they called for health for all by 2000, with a focus on doctors, hospitals, and biomedical advances. It highlighted inequalities in health between developed and developing countries and termed these as politically, socially, and economically unacceptable. However, within a year of Alma-Ata, this all seemed too much. Global politics were shifting. So came the concept of selective primary health and vertical disease-specific interventions. Needless to say, Many have benefited from such vertical interventions. But if you think it works to see a disease instead of a patient, come with me to any of a thousand hospitals or health centres in Africa and see the desperate conditions, the overwhelming number of patients and the under-resourced workforce. Then, more than 40 years after Alma-Ata, I think you'll accept that it doesn't work. Instead, we need an aid model for the 21st century that respects the wishes of the local population that recognises local healthcare providers are best placed to understand the structural violence and countless barriers to care the local population must overcome, and an aid model that strengthens the system with the end goal of not being needed at all. For those who travel overseas, doubtless evoking memories of Hugh Greenwood himself, striving to help as many children as you can during your lifetime, now is the time to pause and ask a difficult question. Are you strengthening the system or perpetuating the legacy of interventionism, thus sustaining dependency? When Gareth first sat us down and pressed for the creation of Kids Operating Room, we were hesitant, believing the status quo would take us forward. I am now convinced he was right. The status quo isn't working. As he now pushes us all further to challenge the status quo, it is impossible not to agree with him that change is urgently needed in how global health aid is delivered. Otherwise, we'll still be here in another 40 years, and that's not good enough. And more importantly, we believe the 10 in every 11 children in the world today who still can't access safe surgical care when they need it would agree with Gareth too. The status quo isn't working. As the world emerges from this pandemic, let us all embrace Hugh Greenwood's vision of helping as many children as we can, but let us have the strength and the wisdom to know the best way to do that 
is to listen, teach, but also learn and support local providers so we can truly reach a world where health equity is a reality, something that will benefit us all. Thank you very much.